What is going on, everyone? My name is Jared Haas with FrenchStretch.com, and today we have a special edition in there. I did a deep dive on Mike Leffingwell, and who else to join to tell his side of the story is Mike Leffingwell. Mike, it is a pleasure to have you on here as well. Um, very interesting. Like I said, racing brings everything together. I do want to know, I did not find a lot in my research about your racing career. How did you get your start into racing? Um, I started in motorcycles probably about the age of seven, eight years old. And my dad would never take me to a racetrack. So I had to take my dirt bike to my buddy's house. His dad would take us up to a place in West Virginia called Aston. And it was actually called the Sand Pit. And I'd go up there and race as a kid. And then I moved into uh, four wheelers and then um, got out of that, got married. And then a buddy of mine, Mike Bias, somebody I always looked up to. He's a huge motocross star back in the day. He started racing legend cars. And um, so I went up to a place called Ona Speedway, and I started watching him race legend cars. And I come back, and I couldn't afford it. I mean, I'm just working out of the carrying block and construction work, masonry stuff. And I told my mom, I said, you know, if there's any way you could buy me a race car, I think I could go somewhere with this and uh, ended up starting out in legend cars. And um, I was never a huge success in legend cars at the local racetrack. And um, we would go to Charlotte on Tuesday nights. I had Tuesday night thunder. We'd go down there and race, which was four hours from West Virginia. And then um, eventually ended up trading my legend car for an open wheel modified. And I entered a race up there called the Mountaineer 100 and did pretty well. Um, ended up flipping a switch inside the car and totaling it, but um, it, it flipped it over from dirt to asphalt, you know, but just an air mistake. And then um, after that, I went out and run some dirt races and modifieds and some late models and things like that. And um, I just, I had my mind set up. I wanted to go into the NASCAR truck series. I was sponsored by a radio station. And a guy at the radio station, um, I was sponsored by a radio station called Bubba 97.1 out of Huntington, West Virginia. And the guy said, Mike, you ever thought about running NASCAR trucks? Well, no, but I'm going to head that direction. Um, I didn't even know who Jack Sprague was whenever I went to the first race. And people's like, this is Jack Sprague and this is this person and Hornaday. And how do you feel about these people, Mike? I don't know none of these people. I was more intimidated at racing at Ona Speedway against a person I considered my hero, Mike Boss, um, in legend cars and Tim Dome and these guys. And I mean, these guys was fast on a local track. Well, then I jumped down here in NASCAR truck series and um, applied for a license with NASCAR and they approved me. And I had to go down and try to find a team. And, you know, I'm just a normal guy. My family's normal people. I had to go and actually get my sponsors. I didn't have a dad coming in writing checks. I didn't have no corporate money, nothing. And I ended up calling and sending out stuff. And I remember it was at about five o'clock in the evening and I had been working on a deal. I think the guy's name was Rich Lamprey out of Aaron's Rents. And I'd send them everything for two weeks why they should get involved in NASCAR. And all of a sudden, I call at 510, and this guy answered the phone at Aaron's Rents in Georgia. And he said, corporate office, and he said, hello. And I said, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of Aaron's Rents. He said, this is Aaron Rents. I said, who are you? He said, my name's Kim Butler, president of Aaron's Rents. He said, who are you? I said, Mike Leffingwell. I said, man, I'm trying to make a NASCAR truck race. I need a sponsor. And he said, I've done looked at everything. Let's do it. And that's how I got started. And um, after that, you know, it's it's. I, I went to Memphis. I learned a lot about Memphis, how the, how the sport worked. And I went out, tried to make other races, went to the goodies dash, things like that. But, you know, Mr. Haas, my thing was, not only for me, but I was bringing sponsors to other teams, you know, um, 58 team in the Bush series, you know, and I reached out to them guys this week. And since you have brought this up, I have reached out to people in NASCAR and people's like, man, Mike, what happened to you? Well, got in trouble, went to prison. You know, I've had I've, everything in the, in the world happened to me uh, a couple of years ago, had a trauma case you know, had to go in the hospital, all this stuff. 
I've had problems with other events I've tried to do, but I've hit a lot of home runs that people didn't know about. It seems like the news always carried the bad stuff. So I want to tell about the good stuff and the bad stuff. And hopefully there's a young driver out there listening that says, man, <laughs> I don't want to go what this guy did. And um, one thing I want to say, and I don't mean to get choked up, but whenever you look back at your life, man, there's a lot of heartache, a lot of good times. And uh, man, it, it's, it's a rough life, you know, but it's life. And one thing I want to say, I always had a hero out there in the Bush series and stuff like that. And he, w- he was on um, Dale Jr.'s podcast the other night and uh, Casey Atwood. And I always wondered what happened to Casey Atwood. And after I heard his story, I was just like, how many, how many racers does this really happen to? You know what I'm saying? Things with his career and things. Because about this, it's, it's like I say, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. And if you don't get a rock and roll, get ready for some bruises. And the thing about racing is it's the biggest drug in the world. You will keep doing everything you can to race. And real racers are competitors, no matter what they face in life. Um, so that's kind of where I went to to get into this sport. I'm curious, as you mentioned, you made that start in Memphis, too. We talked about yeah. that, and we'll talk about, like I said, an attempt I did not know about when I was doing the research. How did you meet with uh, Lonnie Troxel? Um, I know he, at the car, the truck you actually drove was an old McDonald tr- uh, yeah. motorsports truck that ran at Dover in 2000. That's why it had the NASCAR 2000 logos on there. So how did you meet with uh, Troxel and get that deal? To get, like I said, you brought in Kent Butler or... How did you find uh, Troxel to get that truck deal together? I, I tell you how I did it, and a lot of people don't understand the legwork that I've put into it. I would drive from Huntington, West Virginia, to uh, Mooresville, North Carolina, and knock on doors. And I didn't know about how to get a NASCAR license or nothing. And I would go down, and the first person I met with was Brett Bodine. And me and Brett went to lunch and, you know, Brett just gave me some good insight on how the whole sport works. And man, still to this day, um, Brett Bodine, Dick Trickle. I had a lot of talks with Dick Trickle. Love them guys to death, man. I mean, those guys, they were solid people that would sit down and talk to me and nobody and say, Mike, this is how you get into the sport. Nobody else would tell me. So, you know, that's how I did it. Well, anyway, I ended up meeting with um, (laughs) Doc McDonald, and it was so funny. Doc McDonald, I went, I met with him and his wife, went through the shop and everything. And um, anyway, he called me after the first of the season, and he said, hey, if you get a license, we may have a truck you can drive. And I said, okay. So anyway, I'm talking to him and everything, and I said, wow, I said, Uh, I guess you want me to be your driver? He said, well, I've got another partner, which was Lonnie Troxel. And Lonnie, he would furnish Lonnie trucks and stuff. So I got involved with Lonnie Troxel. And me and Lonnie had talks every morning uh, before my truck race. And years later, me and Lonnie, even when I got involved in stuff in Nashville and Bike Week, me and Lonnie still talked. Great guy, love him to death. He was just, he was there as a real person. But, you know, um, what happened was uh, I was talking to Doc one day, and I said, what made you want me to uh, drive your truck? And he said, uh, our other driver had a wreck at Daytona and broke his neck. (laughs) I'm like, what? (laughs) And um, it was his son, Randy McDonald, ended up having a bad wreck. And then um, actually at Gateway International with Playcraft Boats, um, actually his, uh, daughter was, uh, spotting for me out there during practice and all that. So, um, but love them people to death. Great people. And that was going to make mention into, like I said, the next topic I was going to talk about. I didn't know that in my research is that you made another attempt in 2002 at gateway with yeah. the aforementioned playcraft boats. Mm-hmm. Um, you, the reason why I didn't show up is Aaron Daniel actually bought the ride since your truck uh rack during the practice session you didn't get to qualify but you were able they were the team was high enough for provisionals to get the points 
So what do you remember from that week- weekend at Gateway? Like I said, disappointed that you wreck out, but you were there that weekend as well. I, I remember sitting at the house and I didn't have no plans of trying to race or anything. And Lonnie Troxel called me and said, Hey, and, and it ain't just with gateway. There's other two, as I get time, I'll show you, but Martinsville with different drivers, Richmond, where whoever they had for a driver was not doing well and performing. And Lonnie called me and, me and my a guy that fueled my truck, uh, Jason, or not Jason Starkey, Jeff Starkey, he, he went with me out there. Um, I got in the truck, and I think we was 20th in practice, a couple rounds of practice. We was doing really good. And I got up there beating and banging with uh, Mike Wallace. And Lonnie Troxel come on the radio and said, hey, make one more lap and pull in and quit beating with them guys. And all of a sudden, I don't know if somebody hit me or something happened and that truck took off and it felt like it went to 400 miles an hour through the grass hood flap come opened and um, it it took a tumble or two and it smacked the wall and ended up breaking my foot. Um, The truck had blowed some fire out. They was trying to get me to put my window net down, but everything that, um, Terry McDonald was saying, Doc's daughter to me, my spotter on the radio, nothing was coming through to me. If she said something, I knew what she was saying, but to get my body to work, it was like a really long delay. So I had a concussion and all that. And then meeting with them guys and everything, after I went to the end care center, later that night I went to the hospital. But after meeting with all them people, they made the decision, hey, let's go ahead and do a deal with Aaron Daniel. Um, This truck was so smashed, they had to cut it at the front of the firewall to get it in the transporter. It was shaped like an L. Um, It broke the harness. It ripped the Hans device that bolts into your helmet. It tore out the Simpson helmet, the side of it. That's how hard I hit. And um, God, how I survived it, I don't know. But just just thank the Lord for that. But at the same time, Aaron Daniel, I I believe I started the race. We had to run one lap for the points deal, and then Aaron Daniel got in it and finished up the race. That's why in practice it was a Chevrolet truck with Playcraft boats. He run a Ford truck because he had the truck, the backup truck. And um, that's why it was a 93 Ford truck during the race with him driving. Yeah, so that like I said, that started I didn't know about, which is interesting to see. And Aaron Daniel did have playcraft boats on that truck during that race. And I'm curious yeah. how that you said you were going to start a Bush team, and you showed uh, this '58 car right here. What's the story behind this? How did you buy this car, and what was the plans with uh, that Bush team? Uh, Brian Weber, yeah, great guy. But anyway, I, I looked and I seen, you know, I'd, I'd had a broken foot, and I thought you know, I'm going to call this guy. He was across from Billy Blue's shop in Mooresville at the race park. And we had so many good times there, me and Trent Owens and all of us. It was just, it was hectic in that park. But, and anyway, I ended up calling him and said, Hey, Brian, I'll buy your car. I'll pay for tires, hotels, everything. Let me get a sponsor on that car for the race. And that's what we did. I put RPM magazine on it. It was a trucker magazine think we run that race maybe another one or something sold the car off um all that did the deal with him and you know since this has happened i reached out to him and um you know who knows what the future holds maybe it's a team with me some old rookies and maybe some past champions we just start a team old dogs new tricks and try to jump into this thing next year we don't know you know but um it was pretty interesting having good talks with him about um, you know, hey man, is it okay if I share this and what's going on with you in your life? And this is what happened to me. So that's how I got into that. Yeah. And Weber did make a start uh in 2023. Uh, try to make an attempt to start at Phoenix with MBM Motorsports. So he has made yeah. a come uh attempted to come back. Uh, I'm curious on the forefront now. Like I said, this you had this period where you still trying to go to racing 04 or 05. When did it more or less fizzled out? What was kind of the I don't want to say the last hurrah, but what 
kind of just was the last event at NASCAR you had? I think I think probably oh four. Um you know, I was a kid that um come from a small town and you get into NASCAR and start making some money and not only that money, money I would take to other teams. And you know, gosh, my my biggest downfall out of all of it was not having proper accountants, lawyers, contracts. Um, I got into alcohol partying and just my life just started spiraling out of control. And, um, you know, so that was pretty much it. And then I got in trouble over the Playcraft Boats deal. I owned some bars, ended up buying some bars and restaurants, and I got in trouble a little bit with some illegal poker machines and it just ended up hitting me. And then I ended up getting a fed indictment and going to prison. And, you know, it was like, wow, what do you do after this? This is like a big hit. And, uh, you know, you just got to face it. It's part of life. I think it's not a good part of life, but it's still living life. And I think, you know, I always tell people, you know, my, I lost my father a couple of years ago. One thing my dad told me on his deathbed was, man, and my dad went to Nashville years ago, if we get into that, but that was my Nashville connection. But he made some records and all that and come back, ended up working in a steel plant in West Virginia his whole life. But, you know, my dad told me, he said, you know, Michael, if you die today, you've really lived life. I mean, I've chased every dream I've had, every dream. And that takes a lot of guts because you will you will lose dreams you will get beat up doing it mr haas but you know at the same time it's um it's been a long road man but i tell you when whenever i went there to prison i was there two years maybe three i got sober um worked out you know i mean just really had a big comeback and and you know when i when i got out people don't know this part when i got out of prison I had to do my halfway house time in Missouri and I ended up getting a TV show at a casino with a local channel building a motorcycle chopper on TV. It was a local Fox network and I was the host of the show and everybody's like, Oh, now he wants to be a big chopper builder. No, I wasn't a chopper builder. I had mechanics building the bikes. I'm just sitting here hosting the show. And then um, feds come back, hit me again, uh, violation of, probation i went back again for nine months i got out and i changed and i moved to nashville where part of my family was and i went there and ended up buying some motorcycle shops and um, started there and got into the motorcycle business till the economy hit but i've never really had a chance of going and and racing nothing again and you know after all this come out i thought well why not go try to make a couple races just for the fun of it? whether it's in nascar or a local legend race or whatever it is you know just something fun but i guess about a year and a half ago i did get into a indoor karting series with electric go-karts super quick and um it made me realize how bad out of shape I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's like Casey Atwood said, and, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. even said it. You go to a local track now, you're in a late model, and you got all these younger people coming at you. And it's like, well, they can't outrun me. I did this or I did that. And they still smoke you. And that's the fun part of it, you know, because more than anything, I love watching younger people whether it's a five-year-old on a motorcycle or four-wheelers or these kids in go-karts or kids in legend cars or even the younger generation in NASCAR, I love that stuff, man. I just like watching them them people race like that coming up. Yeah, and you mentioned you had issues with alcoholism. How many years sober are you? I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm still not sober. I got sober for three years, uh, started drinking again, The day my father called me and told me he had brain cancer, I went straight to the store and picked up a 12-pack. I weighed 180 pounds at the time. I went and picked up a 12-pack, started drinking, and um, quit working out. I was working out every day. Life was great. I go right back to the alcohol. And, um, you know, I drink beer. I don't drink liquor, nothing like that. And that's not making no excuses. Um, It's still a cushion, but... um, 
I struggle with it. You know, I'll go a week, maybe two weeks and not drink nothing. And then I'll go and drink four or five beers a day. It like knocks the edge off. I've never done pills, heroin, drugs, nothing like that. But um, alcohol is a drug, you know, and, and after researching everything, I mean, food's a drug. There's all kinds of drugs people can get out there. But at the same time, my, uh, my deal with the beer, oh, my God, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I, I struggle with it still daily. I mean, not every day, but a good part of the week. So I ain't, I ain't going to sit here and say, hey, everything life's better. So, uh, but yeah, alcohol, yeah. I mean, Mr. Haas, it's a struggle, but you know, um, I do, uh, like, like I say, I've, I had a, uh, a bad trauma case and, uh, my colon, I, I was doing Lake Ozark music fest. So everybody's like, Oh my God, he canceled it. Well, no, I didn't cancel it. My colon busted. Everybody's been refunded. People's been refunded with bike week, you know, um, so, you know, but at the same time, I've been dealing with health issues for the last year and a half. And um, I'm hopefully to have all this cured up here in the next month or so and be able to actually go get sober, work out. Whenever I, I usually trade one addiction for another, whenever I'm working out, I don't drink. And um, if I'm not working out, I drink. I don't know what it is. You know, it's it's the beer and the chicken wings. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you mentioned, I want you to give you a chance to re, you know, yeah. uh, to refute what what was happened with Nashville Bike Week and obviously the Lake Ozark Festival. Given yeah. your side of the spectrum of the two different events, I'll start with yeah. Nashville Bike Week. Uh, yeah. What happened with that? Because there was allegedly you didn't sign the mass permit uh, permit that was there mm -hmm. um did you sign it and what happened to, to tie loose ends on that event from your perspective nashville bike week you got to look at here here's one of the things with bike week everybody got paid every band staging company we had a full office staff everybody's getting paid weekly for two years building this thing we are dealing with the state of tennessee has a mass ordinance permit well, they're telling us, hey, don't apply until about a month out because you don't have know how many people's coming, okay? Well, then all of a sudden, that lady from the state retires, a new guy comes in, and he says, hey, I need you to fill out for a mass ordinance permit. Well, if you fill it out, you've got to set it for 5,000 or 100,000 people. If I set it for 100,000 people and I've only got 10,000 showing up, I have all this extra cost with porta potties because you got to supply 175 porta potties for so many women, so many men, you know. So it's like it's crazy. I think it's 500 people, 175 porta potties. And so, anyway, when we did that, I had to have a go and, and secure a hospital in case a trauma event happened there or something. And we did all this. All of a sudden, Homeland Security comes in and says, listen, this guy's a felon. We're shutting it down. We're not having a bunch of bikers here. And the people that do it now, people's got to realize Nashville Bike Week was massive. We had the event in 2016 by Opryland. I sent you some pictures of that. We had it outdoors. Um, I think we had six or nine bands and it was the pre-party and it was massive and it went well. Well, when you start talking about camping people and all this, it changes everything. Well, then we moved from Nashville down to Loretta's. She does her motocross there. Well, all of a sudden I'm bringing in Harley Davidson's. Well, now, man, we're not allowing that. But this other place that's been doing it down there with dirt bikes, kids on dirt bikes for all these years, they've never filled out for a mass ordinance permit. So they didn't want the event. How do you stop it? Cut the head of the snake off. That was me. Put me in jail. Make me look like a bad person. The news back the sheriff's office. Um, you know, he's a felon. He's got warrants. He's refusing to refund people. I'm not refusing to refund nobody credit card companies, refunded people. Um, he's got a warrant. 
well, what's a warrant for? So when people hear that on the news, he's got a warrant, they think, man, he's run off with all the money and didn't pay nobody. No, my warrant was for filling out a piece of paper at the clerk's office and they charged me with aggravated perjury. <laughs> so even, even the judge has never heard of such something like that. But still, how do you how do you get this guy out of here to stop this event? Because they think you're bringing in drugs, guns, everything else. They've been watching Sons of Anarchy too much. And it made me realize, hey, some events right now in this country, life's changed. And no matter how people want to look at it, and there's just some things they want and some things they don't. They didn't want Nashville Bike Week. Okay. Um, I've learned to go where I'm, uh, tolerated, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, wanted and, and to help events that work out well. And Nashville bike week was close to my heart. It's like a guy said, he said, man, I know Mike, if Mike was going to try to rip you all off, he's done said he's start, I, I started booking bands already for the next year. And he said he wants to keep it going 10, 20 years. That's how you make the money at it. But um, it didn't work out, but it, it brought a lot of good things in my life, no matter me going to jail and doing time over signing a piece of paper, which was probably the ridiculous thing ever in my life I've seen in this country. But same time, I don't want to get into that. But, um, you know, I got to have a, a pretty close relationship with Gene Simmons and learned a lot about that and got to. Uh, you know, hang, hang around um, Irv Woolsley a lot, George Strait's manager. And them guys, both of them guys give me great advice on um, promoting industry, things like that. Um, so I kind of, I, I took notes and learned a lot from it. So that's what happened with Bike Week, you know. So Bike Week was, like I said, that the paperwork was the issue, mm -hmm. as you were yeah. saying. And then Lake Ozark, you mentioned you actually sent a picture of you in the hospital. You had oh, some yeah. health issues with that forefront. Mm -hmm. um, was that the main reason why that it was just you were in the hospital it, with that colon? The, the day it was canceled, I went golfing the day before. The day Lake Ozark Music Fest was canceled, I went golfing the day before. I come home that night. Uh, my mother died of colon cancer, okay, and right in, right in the middle of my racing career. Um, gosh, and it just upset me. I mean, and that really spired my alcohol out of control. And I'm not making excuses for that, but it was the only way I could self-medicate. Um, but at the same time, whenever I went golfing, I come home, I had a pain that night in my right side. I didn't think it was nothing. And I literally canceled Lake Ozark Music Fest with people working from me while I am in the hospital getting took back into trauma five minutes from being dead. When I got there, they done said, hey, this thing's, you went septic already for a day and a half. So we got to do something. And uh, when somebody tells you you're going to be dead in five minutes, holy cow, <laughs> it will change your life. And I mean, it's um it was diverticulitis i've never had no issues before in my life and um it's something i really think everybody in america needs to pay attention to um you know we've had race car drivers die of colon cancer you know andretti um you know mario's son he he died from it you know but it's um this diverticulitis they tell us eat peanuts popcorn all this stuff and anything like that will slice your colon so now my whole life's changed to a different diet, you know, but it will very much humble you and um, and really change your life. But that, that's what happened to Lake Ozark Music Fest. But instantly credit card companies refund everybody, insurance kicks in, and everybody was good. So that happened that, you know, that was more recently. That was just only a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, curious now, like I said, what you're doing what you're wanting to do as you mentioned you kind of want to get back into racing you got the racing itched again but what is currently mike leffingwell doing you know i tell you it's over the years um i, I want to quote something from mike tyson the other day I, I get a lot of haters you know whether it's jealousy or whatever and it's what i told you it's 
you could go into a news media and say, Mike Leffingwell, and they'll print something about me. But, you know, at the same time, I think any time haters or anybody is mentioning my name or worried about what I'm doing, not you, Mr. Haas, but, you know, other people, but, you know, it's, it's, I'm winning. It's, I'm beating them up because they still are, I'm in their head. What's this guy doing? You know, I don't like him and I don't like this and I don't like that. Well, guess what? I won. Um, but for me, in the future, I want to live no matter what I do. And I can't say it's going to be in music. can't say it's going to be in racing. I don't know. Right now, today, I'm focused on my health and I'm focused on being closer to God whether I'm, or I'm drinking or whether I'm sober, you know, um, because I have learned that at 53 years old, this life goes by fast. And listen, some of our next steps moving on to the next phase, and I want to be in, in good with him when I do that. I call a lot of people and try to make amends, whether I've been right or wrong. And you know, whenever you did that first article, I thought, I'm going to reach out to this guy. And that's what I told you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at none of you guys. I mean, it's life. And I own every mistake I've ever made. And I, and I told you other ones about Ryobi Tools and, you know, getting the, the DUI and wrecking the truck, you know. So, I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes. But one thing I know is this. We're all people. I just wish the world would be a better place and stop all the judgment and hate and us just be more about humanity and for the people. If, if that makes sense, you know, it's, um, that's my big thing, but don't count me out of racing. Don't count me out of anything because, um, I wrote a book. I sent you a copy of it. Um, you know, I wrote a book when I was in solitary confinement. And the only reason I really wrote a book was to see if I could write a book. I didn't know how to write a book, so I bought a book in jail on how to write a book. So I accomplished that. Um, I've done some behind-the-scenes stuff for Formula One since they've been coming to the U.S., now Miami and Vegas. So I've been doing some stuff with that. And, um, you know, other than that, it's – I don't know. I mean, it's just – I, it's day by day because after my colon busted, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. So I try to be the best person I can to anybody, whether it's a homeless person or um, whoever it is. I just try to be the best person that day I can and, and take each day. And then if God sends something my way, um, like you doing that interview, <laughs> the one before this one, I got to say, I mean, for some reason, I Googled my name that night and I seen it and I thought, what? You know, so I was like, well, reach out to this guy, you know, at least tell your side and, you know, call up some of your old racing buddies, Brian Weber and them and, you know, Trent Owens and all these guys. I mean, it's just so it's it's cool to to see what some of the old racers are doing now. So but as far as any future plans, I don't know yet. I just take it day by day. Well, I appreciate it, Mike, uh, joining us here. Like I said, telling your side of the story. Yeah. There's a million stories in racing, so mm -hmm. appreciate it for us joining on. And as always, at FrenchStretch.com, like and subscribe. That really helps us out. Jared Haas with FrenchStretch.com. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Also, check one of those two videos out that we have right beside you. Visit FrenchStretch.com for more great content.